Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, host this panel uh, on cultivation and environmental considerations. Uh, I'll be the moderator of the panel today. Uh, my name is Alexander Spellman. I'm the Business Development Director uh, for SIPA Product Security. Uh, we've been providing uh, local track and trace, appellation, and proof of origin control for cannabis uh, here in California uh, with Humboldt, uh, with Yola and Mendocino counties. Uh, with me today is uh, Tara Carver. I'll let Tara introduce herself. I just want to open by saying how grateful and honored I am to be here. I come from the industry. I'm not local government. I, um, I, if I could tell you what, what this experience has been like transitioning from, uh, from a farmer to an advocate, uh, I, in short, I would say just mind-blowing. So thank you for having me. Um, my name is Tara Carver. I'm the executive director of the Humboldt County Growers Alliance. I am also a board member of the California Growers Association and proud co-chair of their policy committee. Good morning, and I'm Josh Hunsinger. I'm the Placer County Agricultural Commissioner and Sealer of Weights and Measures. Uh, my own journey on this started on May 5th, 2015 with a Board of Supervisors meeting where the board said, wow, we got a mess out there. Let's figure out what to do. And just kind of started from there. And, and it's been uh, my, my favorite word for this is fascinating. I think that's the best word probably a lot of you relate. You're on, I'm sure, similar journeys as, as I am in helping find good policy and figuring out what the right place for your own uh, jurisdiction is. So um, I'm excited to be here and talk about some of the uh, issues that I've, I've found and observed in, in my own journey. So thanks. Thanks, Josh. And we're also going to be joined at some point by Amber Morris. Uh, I know she's been delayed by uh, a hearing, uh, but hopefully uh, she'll be able to uh, join us. She is uh, executive director of Cal Cannabis. A few ground rules as we get started. Uh, this is designed to be an interactive session, uh, so we want questions and answers. Uh, as the moderator, uh, I will respectfully reserve the right to try to make sure we stay on topic, uh, also make sure we don't fall into a, a rabbit hole on, on a certain topic to keep things moving and give everybody a chance to, to ask questions uh, of the panelists. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Josh first. I think you had a few slides prepared that you wanted to go through, so perhaps we'll start there and then we'll go into Q&A. All right, so I know the topic today is mostly cultivation and the environment, but I think the thing to keep in mind is that overall, what the, I think the goal, one of the goals of local government is, is to take a, what is largely or completely in a lot of instances an unregulated industry and bring it into a regulated uh, system and, and, and come up with good regulations. And so my comments are a little more geared towards an overall approach to uh, cannabis and local government rather than just cultivation. But I think they're absolutely relevant to these issues. And from the environmental perspective, just really getting the system into a well-regulated system rather than an unregulated system is the best thing we can do to protect the environment. So uh, the first thing I just want to introduce who the Ag Commissioner is, I think hopefully hopefully most people know, but just to uh, go over just real briefly, the Agricultural Commissioner and Sea Level Weights and Measures, uh, we have a variety of responsibilities. State law requires each county to have an Agricultural Commissioner and Sea Level Weights and Measures. Our authority comes from the California Food and Ag Code and Business and Professions Code. We have uh, our primary responsibilities are pesticide regulation, uh, pest prevention, keeping invasive species out of, out of the uh, county, uh, different types of agricultural regulations, such as regulating organic produce, farmers markets, a variety of those types of things. And then all of our weights and measures responsibilities, which are really consumer protection, making sure you, when you buy a gallon of gas, you really get a gallon of gas, or a pound is really a pound when you buy bananas at the grocery store, all those kinds of things. Um, and so we do have a statewide association, the California Ag Commissioners and Sealers Association, or CACASA, and uh, you can find out more about that at kakasa.org. So I'm just going to go through a, lot, a few of the issues that I've observed that are real struggles, not just in Placer County, but in a more global sense. Um, you know, I really study this issue. This is kind of, I've taken this on as one of the, the leads for Placer County. And so I'm going to go through some of the struggles and different things uh, I've observed. The first is who should be the lead agency or department? And I'm sure a lot of you have uh, struggled with that. You know, I've seen different approaches. Some counties, it's the agricultural commissioner. Some, it's the planner or the planning department. Some, it's the sheriff. Maybe there's a public health or environmental health component to it. Or just if you're in a more restrictive county, sometimes code enforcement is the lead on it. And then um, another approach I've observed is the dedicated agency. 
So really, I think that comes down to almost a, um, you know, that's kind of almost a, one of the early decisions that has to be made. And it, it uh, really depends on the philosophy and the perspective of the individual jurisdiction. You know, is it a land use issue? It is, is it a crop? Is it a law enforcement issue? That's really something that, that um, each county has to work through. Uh, I think the bottom line, based on what I've observed, is that you know no matter what, it's going to be a team effort with a lot of different uh, departments within your county. Uh, the next, the next big issue is how do you go from an unregulated system to some sort of a regulated system? Is it a phased approach, or is it just you know if you, if you're going to go with more of a, a licensing system? Uh, implementing the state law at the local level, are you going to expect everybody to at the point where they apply for a permit and come into the light, so to speak, be 100% compliant with every single, you know, little thing like, you know, uh, all of the building, you know, no code violations on the property, every single permit in place, or is it going to be kind of a phased implementation? We have an industry right now that's largely unregulated, and um, there's all kinds of different uh manifestations of that unregulation that would need to be resolved ultimately. So how is that done? Um, this same industry is very adept at avoiding government regulation. They've done it for a lot of years. And they're very uh, resistant to what they perceive as overregulation as well. Um, I think on the, we, as, we as local government have to consider the real cost and time required for businesses to comply. Um, you know, that's a reality. You know, we, we say, you know, hey, you got to fix all this stuff and you can't apply for a permit until you do. You know, that, that can be a very expensive uh, cost and a real cost for some of these folks who have been kind of hiding out on the fringes. Um, you know, there's also perspective that, well, that's, that's their problem, not local governments, certainly. Um, you know, the, another thing to keep in mind in this, in this regard is the state and local uh, taxes and fees on top of whatever the expenses to comply with the local government are. You know, there's a state component, which is also a real cost uh, to compliance. And then what are the downsides to kind of a phased approach where you have a registration followed by a period of working with the industry followed by the actual permitting and what are the downsides and risks to doing that and letting kind of the cat out of the bag prematurely. The next issue is, is similar and that's, that's kind of what I call, does the tail wag the dog? Do you implement policy that incorporates and, ad and accounts for the look and the character of your existing industry versus creating policy that um, in, that is good policy and require the industry to step up to that standard. And so I'll give you a good example. If your industry is largely on two to five acre parcels, if cultivation is commonly done in your county on two to five acre parcels, and you have a choice. You can write an ordinance that, that allows for commercial cultivation on two to five acre parcels. Or you might choose a different approach and say, you know, we're going to implement a minimum parcel size for commercial cultivation of 20 acres. And if you're not at that standard, you need to find a new place to operate. A lot of the complaints and a lot of the issues that local government deals with are due to incompatible land use. You know, I, I think that the most egregious example would be, you know, obviously the butane honey oil labs in residences that we're all familiar with, and that's basically a volatile manufacturing business as a home occupancy. And that's obviously, um, you know, wouldn't you know? Regardless of whether it's cannabis or something else, that's obviously a bad idea, and so and that's a zoning issue among other problems. Um, and so, really, creating a system that is based on good land use policy versus a system that incorporates existing practices, that's really a decision that has to be made. Or maybe there's something in the middle where there's certain places where you give allowances to the industry, and other places where you. Uh, force the industry to adapt to the correct uh, types of land use policies. So next I want to talk a little bit about ordinance development pitfalls. And again, these are some of the things that I've observed, not just in Placer County, but in other places as well. Um, one of them is really focusing wholly on cultivation. Cultivation seems to be the driver where a lot of people or a lot of, a lot of uh, local government really focuses on because that's where we're getting the complaints. Gosh, my neighbor's got those those hundred plants in the backyard and they're just stinking me out and I can't have 
dinner on my back deck and I'm tired of looking at it and I'm tired of explaining what it is to my kids. That's really, at least in Placer County, the types of complaints we mostly get. their odor and visibility, proximity to neighbors. Um, and uh, so we focus on cultivation, but in this new regulated state system, cultivation is just one aspect of a complete regulated system. And so it's really important for local government to understand that there's a whole bunch of different components beyond just cultivation. Uh, the current industry is one where the cultivator is also the retailer and that's, that's uh, radically changing. The next pitfall I would say is the lack of knowledge of current state laws and regulations. And um, that's obviously a moving target, but it requires an incredible investment in staff time to have staff that's up to speed on what the local laws and regulations are. And it's probably not just a planner or not just a county council uh, attorney or not just somebody from the CEO's office, but it's a it's going to be a team that has to come up to speed on um, on these laws and regulations because without that that really deep strong knowledge of state laws and regulations you can't form good policy and really then you know the pitfall is developing ordinance language does, that doesn't um, it's not consistent with state law you know we I was, I was at a recent uh, work group meeting in another county and they were talking about you know some of the water quality uh, impacts and you know hey we got to do something in an ordinance to address water quality impacts and, and it really seemed like the group was pretty unaware of you know kind of what the the regional water quality control board had already put into place exactly on that issue and so it's like no need to reinvent the wheel and then um, lastly you know, I want to talk about some of what I've identified as future challenges. And so, you know, first and foremost, as I just mentioned, the moving target of uh, state law. Since October of 2015, so that was less than two years ago, we've had MRSA, we've had AB21, we've had MCRSA, we've had ALMA, and we've had the trailer bill language. And those are just the big significant laws. There's a whole bunch of other ones that, you know, and each one of those has significantly uh, change the playing field that we're operating on. And so as that continues, and hopefully that'll slow down and stabilize a little bit, that's a real challenge is to keep up with, you know, what the current state law is, what the changes are. And, it, and like I said, it does take a lot of uh, staff resources to, and time to keep up with that. Uh, another one that everyone is going to have to face is the black market. Um, you know, I've heard, you know, leaders in the cannabis industry are pretty free about admitting that about 80 percent of california's uh current market is a black market 80 percent out of state you know kind of activities that are still completely um like fel federal felony type activities um and to whatever extent the Cole memo is still a significant document with the new federal administration that is one of the number one triggers in uh the Cole memo is that prevention of interstate uh, cannabis trafficking. And so that's really something everyone needs to uh, think about addressing. Funding, I, I have what I call the unicorn of the cost neutral program. Everyone's heard of one, but no one's actually seen one. And so that's gonna be, uh, you know, a, a challenge is to have an appropriate level of fees for cost recovery while still not you know, putting the industry, you know, in a place where they can't actually uh, comply. And then um, lastly, kind of the city and county interaction challenge. There's a number of different ways that takes place. Uh, you know, some counties are more conservative than the cities. Some cities are more conservative than the county that they exist in. Um, there's a lot of county programs which are countywide and include the cities as well. An example I would give is as the sealer of weights and measures, I'm supposed to test and seal every commercial device, including scales. I put a county seal on every scale, whether it's in the city or, the, or the unincorporated county. If I am in a county that's very conservative and it has a board that's not supportive of commercial cannabis activities, yet I have a city with dispensaries and they're using scales, I'm supposed to, by law, seal those scales and put a county seal on those scales. Um, and yet that puts me in a real awkward position as a county employee with my board. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh, for that insightful presentation, and I'm sure that's going to generate a lot of questions. Um, before we get to the questions, I wanted to get Tara uh, an opportunity to provide some additional insight and perspective from the industry side.
I'm going to offer a bit of perspective from an uh, industry member from Humboldt County. We, uh, I'm just going to say it, we pioneered uh, the first land use ordinance and we made a lot of good decisions and a lot of mistakes at the same time. And then I'm going to follow up with some of the highlights from our ordinance that I think really um, uh, protect our environment and uh, I think really hold our community's values true. So. Uh, Background on me, I grew up in the industry, I didn't grow up in the industry, I'm sorry, um, but I've spent the last 15 years in the industry and I primarily was on the production end of things in the beautiful Matol Valley. I grew cannabis for about 10 years out there and I really never had a conscience about growing cannabis. I believe in this plant, I've seen what it does to people who are ill, uh, I, it fuels our economy and I come from an industry, a community full of family farms and small businesses. So I was really proud of the work we did. However, about eight years ago, all of a sudden, there started to become a new conversation, and that was produced pretty much out of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And what, what was being talked about was what our industry or my industry was doing to our land. And that was a significant change uh, for me in the thoughts that I had about what I was doing and how I was producing this product and what was happening to, uh, to our environment. Um, so, you know, as an industry, we, we only worked with our friends and our family. That was to remain safe. And so we didn't have, I'm not going to say we didn't have the opportunity, but we were, we didn't bring consultants out to our farms. We just didn't know if they would be followed by the sheriff. Calling the state really wasn't an option for us. And so uh, we've made a lot of mistakes. And so as this regulatory framework or the state started having a conversation about developing one, we started banding together as an industry and really, really addressing some of uh, our concerns and how we were going to move forward with local stakeholders in Humboldt County. Um, I should also note, too, that Google Earth was a big deal for us. I don't know if this was a big deal for you. I literally remember the night when I turned on my computer and somebody called me and said, hey, download this thing and then you're going to be able to, to see the world. And I was like, what do you mean? And then literally we had a 30,000 foot view of what we were doing. And I, it was a dinner party at my house. I had a few farmers from um, other areas within the county and our minds were blown. We had no idea. So. Um, you know, just, just the, I'm not offering excuses for some of the, the things that have happened in the hills, but I do want to offer some perspective on not having perspective. So as the state moved forward and Humboldt County became the first county to create a commercial medical marijuana land use ordinance, and I want to thank the two supervisors, Rex and Estelle, sitting in this room today. It was a 5-0 vote. It was one of the proudest moments of my life and um, I think historic for Humboldt County. And some of the highlights that were incorporated into that ordinance, um, I'm going to touch on briefly. And so when this ordinance was adopted, again, the state was moving towards, well, had adopted or had MC, MMRSA was in play. The Water Board had finished their order and it was, it was now starting to be implemented. And so Humboldt County adopted into their ordinance that all cultivation needed to comply with applicable state laws, including Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Regional Water Board. There's a lot to those orders. And so that was, a, that was the beginning of, of our community being like, oh, okay, what is, this doesn't work and that doesn't work and this isn't gonna be okay and how do we navigate that? We're still dealing with that today and it, it's been a long journey, but um, I think we're, we're better for it. Uh, we also included performance standards in our ordinance. These were the first of its kind for California. Um, we included mixed light cultivation needed to be covered at night. Um, I'm not sure if where we all sit on understanding where mixed light is. I'm not actually sure if the state really has decided where it sits on what mixed light is at this point either. But in Humboldt County and some of our rural counties, we have a big issue with light pollution uh, at night and growing cannabis I'm going to really try not to industry out on you on this one. When you grow cannabis for multiple cycles, you can use supplemental lighting. And we weren't covering our greenhouses. And so in the spring, our hills have little glow bugs all over them. But come to find out, that's an actually really big issue. That is, it's detrimental to, um, honestly, the smallest critters within our ecosystem. And so uh, that was a big learning curve for the industry. We needed to stop the glow or, or what do we call it, Rex? Say no to the glow. That's it. 
So we included that as a performance standard. Um, I think that that's a really important one. We also decided that noise produced by a generator shall not be more than 60 decibels. We're now seeing the state move um, possibly a different direction. We look forward to that. We also have mandated that indoor must be on, or I'm sorry, electrical power must be provided by an on-grid power source with 100% renewable source. On-site zero net energy. Well, never mind. I'm not going to read your language on this. Uh, to produce indoor in Humboldt County, it needs to be produced with 100% renewable resource or sourced power. I think that is groundbreaking. Um, again, we'll see what the state does. I highly encourage you all who are producing land use ordinances to consider that. And I'm just going to say this bluntly: the planes did not fly in Arizona two weeks ago because it was too hot. I'll just leave that at that. So interesting. Policy um, for Humboldt County, because our community, um, had, or my community, the industry has lived in fairly steep and deep areas, which lent to uh, us being able to escape law enforcement, to be real blunt. Uh, we have a lot of sites that will not be able to comply with the local regulations and the state regulations. And so Humboldt County came up with a program called the RRR program, which is retire, remediate, and relocate. And so they are incentivizing farmers who will not be able to comply with local and state licenses to move to a piece of property that does. I won't go into the details of that, but it seems to be fairly su successful. And I would also encourage you to look at options such as that as well. We also limited the size of cultivation depending on the size of the parcel. Josh touched briefly on this. Um, this is twofold, one for, for environmental considerations, but I also think it's really going to help retain our culture. Humboldt County is comprised of relatively small family farms, and I think it's important that it remains that way. That's my perspective, but we also see that reflective in the policy. The biggest issue when we were going through the conversations with stakeholders about the ordinance from my perspective was whether or not we were going to allow new farms on timber project production zones. Now this doesn't necessarily apply to all of you in the room, but it was a big deal up in our county and uh, we decided not to allow new farms in uh, TPZ or kind of more environmentally sensitive lands. Um, another consideration, which is kind of one of my favorites, is uh, the idea of centralized processing. If you are in a producing county, and in a rural county especially, it's very, very important that, at least from my perspective, that the activity of trimming or processing gets removed from our rural areas. The impacts to roads, the lack of resources to workers, the lack of oversight to workers is really um, it's really important that we remove that to, to a more centralized area. So I was really proud of our county for, for offering that, and I think it was cutting edge. And I would highly encourage you to reach out to anybody who understands that concept, and if you are moving forward with a land use ordinance or have one, to incorporate that aspect into it. So with that, I thank you again for being here. So the, the floor is open for questions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a mic to pass around, um, so I'll try to paraphrase the question I think it's asked so everybody in the room can hear it. I just ask that you, you raise your hand uh, and then we'll call on you. Yes, sir. So the RRR in incentives and how that works. I have my planning director in the audience. Um, I'm, I might pivot to you, John, if that's okay in a moment. Um, so the RRR program, um, if your site does not comply, the concept behind it is that you'll be able to move that site or the square footage that you have to another site and be able to multiply it by four times up to 20,000 square feet. And so if you had 5,000 square feet and you could move that cultivation to another site, you would multiply it by four, you get to, to 20. If you have 10, you can multiply by two, and so on and so on and so on. It's an interesting play between the two different or the two different landowners, and uh, that gets more into the legal aspect and contracts and how that works out. Um, the, so I think I'll think I'll leave it at that and honestly offer John the mic if that's okay if you want to 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 it. Go on. I think one of the really important things that's involved in it is the fact that it's a ministerial action. It doesn't require a discretionary permit to relocate. So as Tara said, it allows you to greatly expand the amount of cultivation 
And it also allows that to be done with the ministerial act. So the incentive there is very, very high because you can't get to 20,000 square feet any other way for a new grow. Did everybody get that? So as part of the RR, you have to out remediate the old parcel in addition to migrating to the new one. That's a great question. Um, so existing sites, well, the county put a deadline or a date. If you fell before this and you could prove that you had cultivation, then you were existing. If you fell after that date and proved that you had cultivation, you're, in, you're not in compliance and you would not be able to come into compliance. With pre-existing standard and conditions, the same standard and conditions would need to be met uh, as in any other parcels. Um, however, you know, the, again, the, a lot of our TPZ farmers, there are a lot of legacy farmers. That's where they could get away with it. That's where they have. From more of an industry perspective, this is also where we grow some of the finest cannabis out of Humboldt County. We have really unique angles to the way our hills um, fall. So, and a lot of people live on their land too. And so it, wouldn't, it wasn't going to be necessarily okay to tell them they could not continue and so I, uh, it was a it was it was a long battle and a lot of discussions and a lot of a lot of a lot of work to get where we were but it, there's a clear clear line well per the water board regardless if you're going to be a commercial legal entity the water board you were required to, to enroll so everybody had to enroll in that so yes no, not we. We incorporated, um, uh, well, the county incorporated their own data into that. And thank you. And, and I apologize. That question was in regards to you know legacy cultivating on TPCs and how the, the county was handling that. Yeah, so the question was in the trailer bill on the type three licenses and the limitations and what that might mean. Uh, Josh, I apologize. I'm not Amber Morris. She could do a much better job with this than than I could, but um, uh, the, the best, I think, uh, way to go back to that would be those draft regulations that CDFA had out, and um, my recollection is that they limited each entity to one, you know, it was four acres of total cultivation and one type three license was, was the way those regulations uh, worked at that time. So I think it's very reasonable, you know, just based on my conversations with CDFA to, I think it's reasonable to expect a similar approach to continue. I don't think the trailer bill will cause them to reinvent, you know, you know they're gonna do as little to those regulations as possible would be my guess. Yeah, so the question was in relation to land ordinances, sort of typical cultivation size allowances. What county are you in? Gotcha. Um, Humboldt County, you know, one of, one of the things, and I know if, if anybody in here has been working on cannabis policy for the last three years, is the problem is we don't have real data. We don't know. Um, so f from, from my perspective in Humboldt County, and I love John's perspective too, I'm thinking we're looking at around 15 to, 15 to 19,000 of pre-existing square footage. However, in Humboldt County, we also have 10,000 farms. So when you start cracking those numbers, it gets a little different. Now, how many of them are actually moving forward? Roughly 1,000-ish. So, you know, it, it kind of depends. Um, as for the rest of the state, I'm pretty Humboldt-centric, so I would defer to everybody else on what they're doing. Yeah, a couple comments I have to your question. You know, this is one of those places where really familiarizing, you know, making sure staff is up to speed on the law and what the, you know, what a 1C license versus a 3A license, you know, and just understanding kind of what those categories are in state law and then understanding how the recent draft regulations define, further define those, because uh, I think if you're not aware, that was a really interesting approach they took to only defining mature plant space as counting towards those license categories. So you could actually have a lot more actual cannabis canopy than your license, uh, you know, the base license amount. So um, really just understanding those and, you know, for Placer County, it's, you know, maybe 2,500 square feet, but that's in an unregulated system where people are trying to hide. And I think in a regulated commercial environment, you'd have a lot different situation than you do in a situation where people are trying to, you know, to some extent hide what they're doing. So it's really, you know, what we have now versus what we have in the future. Last thing I would say is, is the state did do a survey uh, six months ago, maybe or so, and they ask every single you know, by county, you know, 
what license types are you interested in? So you can actually go to CDFA's website and it'll show for Contra Costa County kind of the people who filled out the survey, what are they interested in the way of licenses? Thank you. Uh, there's a gentleman in the blue shirt had a question. Yeah, Morgan, yeah, so the question's on indoor grows, pros and cons, um, size, limitations, et cetera. You know, just kind of looking at this, and I'm obviously not part of the industry, looking at it from the, you know, kind of county regulatory perspective, uh, there's there's real costs and benefits to it. I think, you know, one of the big benefits is it's a very uh, confined and is, it's easier to regulate. It's easier to hide, you know, if, if you're doing it in a house or something. But in the commercial regulated sense, I think it's the easiest way to confine it and, um, you know, really dictate the look and the feel and the characteristics of it. The flip side is kind of on the environmental side, uh, if not done correctly, and you know, it's like, you know, I think Tara talked a little bit about what Humboldt's done. Just the, the electrical use is mind-boggling in some senses when you look at it. It's not just lights. Everybody thinks of the lights, but those lights generate heat, and so it becomes the air conditioning. It becomes the 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 level of intensity of the cultivation is so high that they are What's the proper term for stripping out the water? So it's um, no, no. That when they like the deionizing of the water, and they're just there's all these things that they do that are just huge electrical users, and so really ac accounting for that, the flip, you know, you get the really confined, secure facility versus just the electrical use seem to be the two big, in a simple sense. My county primarily uh, doesn't have a lot of indoor. We have, and the indoor that we have is fairly small square footage um, and so you know I, this is a, this is a big deal this is a big conversation right now and um, I predict it to become even more of one um, you know Amber Amber can can talk a little bit about more on the EIR level maybe okay <laughs> um, so but from an industry perspective you know Northern California we produce sun-grown cannabis we produce an incredible amount of it and it's really good however how do I say this? It's troubling in our minds to understand a lot of, or at least a lot of sun-grown members of mine, why we would take the sun and then put this plant in buildings with big light, you know, high-intensity lighting. It doesn't really make all that much sense. And then I go to a lot of indoor farmers and they, well, this and this and this. I'm like, I, I understand that and I get that. But again, why we're growing plants in a building when there's the sun, it just doesn't quite compute. Now, that's a very personal position of mine, and I want to say that. This is not, this is, again, a big conversation, but, you know, I, I look forward to seeing what California does in the future. Uh, before we get to some more questions, and I do know that we have a question and a question, I wanted to introduce Amber Morris uh, and give Amber a, a few minutes uh, to provide some perspective, and then we're going to throw you right into the deep end. There's an open question about uh, indoor cultivation. Uh, so we'll pass it over to Amber and give her a few minutes. All right. Is it morning still? Good morning. Sorry I'm late. It's so rude of me, but I, I appreciate uh, being here. I was just at a Senate hearing, and they were asking, how are you commuting with the county, communicating with the counties? I'm like, I gotta go. <laughs> I'm going to be there right now. Um, so I'm just going to give you uh, down and dirty where the state is, kind of clue you in on uh, touch points with the local agencies. And it's so nice to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. Um, I, I'm Amber Morris, the branch chief for California Department of Food and Agriculture's Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing Program. It's a bunch of words, but basically um, our department is tasked with licensing cultivators at the state level. With that, we're doing a statewide program environmental impact report and also standing up two technology projects. One is to allow cultivators to apply online, and the second is to stand up the state's track and trace system that all the licensing authorities will be using. Um, I did have a PowerPoint. No? There's just... Oh, the computer's not working? So um, it's all on our website, but there is a, a nice graphic that shows you which state department is responsible for the different areas of cannabis licensing in case you are interested. And it looks like somebody's got the slide there. Oh, good. Oh, good. Perfect. So just with, um, we'll start with legislation. That's probably the best place to, and I apologize if I'm repeating things. Have you guys already gone through that? Okay, so legislation, we started out with medical legislation 
passed at the end of 2015, went into law uh, early 2016. So just for medical. Then the voters passed uh, the Adult Use of Mar Marijuana Act in November last year. And then just in June, I want to say 27th, the governor signed SB 94. And what SB 94 did was it basically took the two existing laws, we had medical and adult use that were separate, that had differences, that really would have made it a difficulty for uh, the industry to be compliant, for regulators to do their job easily, well, well, easily, well, maybe, is a better way to say it. But you know, you put out two sets of rules for growing the same plant and it's gonna cause confusion. So luckily, we're in a good place now where our um, administration, the governor's office, and also uh, legislature, they put a, a new bill out, SB 94, and that basically um, created one set of laws for medicinal. And by the way, they changed the word medical to medicinal. And I'm trying to get that into my vocabulary now. But it used to be medical, and now it's medicinal. So we're going with it. Um, so the, the one act, and now it's got this crazy acronym, M-A-U-C-R-S-A. I just call it the act, um, but it covers both medical and adult use. So I'll refer to that as the act moving forward, but the act did some things that changed the medical legislation that had previous, previously passed. I think uh, specifically it, um, so it made it clear what department is responsible for what. So right now, um, the Department of Consumer Affairs, so you'll hear about the Bureau, and the Bureau sits under the Department of Consumer Affairs, and they're responsible for retail, so dispensing, also for distribution and testing labs. The Department of Public Health is responsible for manufacturing, so anything that takes the raw flour and turns it into something other than raw flour, so a whole uh, flurry of items that keeps growing. Um, the Department of Public Health is responsible for that. So I know at the local level you guys are deciding what you're going to allow in your communities and I would just suggest that you keep um, up to speed with what those three agencies are doing if you're interested in any of those uh, three licensing types. So we're responsible again for cultivation. With cultivation we had to do a program environmental impact report. Oh let me back up. So legislation. Who creates the laws? Yeah, I heard that. So the people, yeah, right, the voters, and? Woohoo! A whole bunch of government people that know the answer, I love it. Sometimes I just get a bunch of blank looks, and even um, in interviews for my own department, I ask, you know, what's the difference between a law and a regulation, and it, I don't think it's all that clear to people. So yes, law is created by the legislature and by the people. We, the Department of Food and Agriculture, do not create the law. What we do is we create regulations. And the regulations further define the law. So uh, for, make it clear what the law means. So sometimes the law can be a little ambiguous and we fill in the details. Um, so that's what we are um, tasked to do. We started out with medical. We just went out in April with proposed regulations for the medical laws. So what happened to the medical laws? They're repealed. What happens to our medical proposed regulations? We get to withdraw them. Um, so, but it, it's not a lot of fun, busy work for us. It actually is the foundation that we're going to be using moving forward. So I know you guys struggle, struggle with what is the state doing? What is the state doing? Oh my God, now the medical law is gone. What are we going to do? So medical proposed regulations are still a good place to be looking on kind of the direction the state's moving. We did have public comments on the medical regulations and we received a lot of feedback, a lot of very valuable input that we will be using moving forward. Um, so what we do with our comments now um, in the APA process, the Administrative Procedures Act, that's what the state has to follow for the development of regulations. Uh, normally we would be um, obligated to respond to individual comments. Every comment that we receive, it's an obligation to respond. But since we're withdrawing our regulatory package, we don't have to despond, despond. We don't have to respond directly. To, <laughs> great, come on. We don't have to respond directly to every comment. But what we're going to be doing is putting out a summary of the comments that we received, the areas in our regulations where people had concerns, and they have legitimate concerns. And I do really value the input that we received. And I know we did receive input from industry, from our local agencies, from the public, from all kinds of people. 
Um, but we're going to be summarizing the areas of our medical regulations that may be changing based on comments. So that when we move out with a combined package that's going to address both medical and adult use, you'll have a better idea of, okay, here are the proposed medical regulations. It's a good place to start. But here's this document that summarizes where we might be changing things. So that's, uh, we've drafted it, we're working with the other two licensing authorities to do the same thing so that those comments that we received, they're not just going to be thrown away and not considered. Those are actually what we're going to be using to move forward with our combined package. Because, and I'm sorry, I'm being really long-winded, I'm going to make it, I'm going to speed it up. Um, so, moving forward, we have to, with the APA process, it usually takes about a year to get regulations through the whole process. So you develop them, you go out for comment, you change them, you go back out for comment, you change them, you might go back up for comment. So it, it's a, it takes a long time to get through the process because we have to get this done by January 1 and have the regulations out and available to all of our stakeholders. We'll be using authority for emergency regulations, which goes through a little bit of a different process. So the foundation, again, for our emergency regulations will be the draft medical regulations we put out and we just went through them we're going to recycle a lot of that material so I would say like 90% of it is going to be very similar um, but when emergency regulations go out they go out as is okay <laughs> they go out as is and then it's a requirement to follow up with regular rulemaking so you go out as is it's an emergency this is what it is and then you have to follow up with regular rulemaking so go through the whole public comment process um, and we, ha we are obligated by statute to complete that process within 360 days of submitting our emergency regulations. So once our emergencies go out, we will start our regular rulemaking process. Um, and that's another opportunity for you guys to engage. Um, we will be engaging the whole time until we go out with emergency regulations for those areas that we're going to be clarifying. But that's kind of where we're at with regulations and what our plan is. We plan to get our emergency regulations out in the fall and um, have them available by January 1. We're trying to do it as early as we can, but it has to be paired up with CEQA. So I'll move on to CEQA. So CEQA, we've got a statewide environmental, sorry, statewide program environmental impact report that we are in the process of completing. We issued the draft program environmental impacts report on June 15th, so that is out right now and available for your review, and we really encourage your comments. Um, the draft basically covers the statewide program, and with that, we're unable to address everything that CEQA needs addressed. So when I say that, I like to use the example, we can do many things on a statewide level, but with CEQA, there's really specific things that you need to analyze, and we can't do that for specific things because it requires that you know the site. There's site-specific specific analysis that needs to be conducted. And so in our draft program EIR, at the end of every section, so like the first section will be aesthetics, and it'll tell you, okay, um, less than significant impact. Or it'll be called out at the end of the section, less than significant, or uh, they're a potential significant impact unless that site specific is done. So the draft actually calls out where we have holes that need to be addressed with site specific CEQA. With the change in law that just occurred in June, there's a, a new kind of county rule, local rule. Um, so where with medical, you were required to come to the state with a local permit uh, authorization Permit, what's the word? There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Permit license or other authorization, yeah. Um, that has changed a little bit. The law, and I had it in the slides, it's uh, Business and Professions Code 26, oh, somebody got that? 26055E. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. <laughs> uh, my fellow ledge advocate here, right? Um, okay, so this this code is very important for the locals, and it basically calls out when the state gets an application, it is not now the applicant's obligation to provide their local permit or authorization. The state gets to go through a fund process, and I'm just going to walk you through it really quickly. Uh, the process is we get an application for a state license. They say, I live in Napa County, and I want to grow weed. <laughs> we say, what size? What license? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, well, that's it. So their application, we receive the application, and then we are obligated. They can, they are, um, they may provide their license with that application. They're not required to. So they may provide it if they do not, even if they do provide it. So we receive an application. They say, I want to grow in Napa. They provide me the license that Napa gave them. I still have to reach out to the local agency. And in the law, it tells me uh, the, the local contact, there's a specific things in the law that say that you have to establish a local contact. You have to give it to the bureau. The bureau is going to share it with us. So first, you're going to have to have a local contact, the right person you want for the state to be coming at. OK, we got this application. And what we ask you is, this, is this applicant in compliance with all local laws, regulations, ordinances, blah, blah, blah. Now, you have three options. You can say, yes, they are. And I'll go ahead and process the application on my side. You can say, no, they're not. That stops my process. I'm not going to give them a license if you say they are not in compliance at the local level. You can say nothing. That's your third option. There's silence is an option. If you do not respond within 60 days, the state moves forward and can issue the license. So there's also this other clause that says you can then also respond after 60 days, after I've already issued a license, and tell me that they shouldn't have the license. At that point, I have the option to either revoke their license or just not to renew it when renewal comes up in the, in, in the year. So every license is good for a year. But that's kind of a big change in what was happening before. And I just wanted to make sure that that's clear to all of you that there's now a new process where we do have to validate with you first. And even, I checked last night, the, the verbiage to me looks like even if they come with a local license, we still need to verify with the local agency. Seeing the lawyer nodding his head, all right. Um, so that's kind of a big thing. And there's one other thing I wanted to cover. Um, like I said before, we, in our statewide, um, in our statewide program EIR, we have those holes, right? So before we license anybody, we're going to have to make sure that those holes in our CEQA document are addressed. And it's either going to be by a document that you're putting together, the local agency is putting together, or the applicant themselves will have to provide environmental documentation and we will become the lead agency to certify that for the holes that aren't addressed by our statewide PEIR. Mind blown, huh? <laughs> so, um, track and trace, we have a vendor. We got a vendor on board uh, just at the end of the month, last month. Metric, who is also used in Colorado, Oregon, Alaska, Michigan, Maryland, is going to be our vendor at the statewide level. So any person who has a state license will have to use metric as their track and trace. Again, counties are able to have their own track and trace. Right now, we're working through the process of what our ability to interface with your track and trace may be. I'm not going to promise that it'll happen immediately, but we do understand that there are counties out there who have developed their own track and trace. And we're trying to figure out a good solution to for that. But um, but we're really excited to have Metric on board. We've gone through the timelines, and it, there's no big red flags that we can't get this done by January 1. So happy news. I'm going to stop there and open it up for questions, because I think I just threw a lot at you. Um, thanks, Amber. I wanted to respect the, the queue of the questions that we had. So uh, Peter, I'll get to you in a sec. Uh, behind you, we'll have the lady with a question. I'll try to paraphrase that then. There's a, the start of the question is you have Existing cultivating activity, including a variety of different crop types, what happens when you intermix cannabis into some of those other legacy agricultural processes? Uh, and then that leads into sort of subsequent questions on security, agritourism, things of that nature. Maybe Josh, you want to handle that first? Yeah, this is exactly one of the issues that I, I uh, talk about a lot. And so um, I, I would characterize at least the growers in Placer County, you know, the conversations I have with, with the farming community, I, you know, we talk about this at our monthly Farm Bureau meetings and whatnot every month. And there's kind of two different perspectives that growers have. Uh, you know, the first is I'm a pretty darn good grower of plants. And I think I'd be a pretty darn good cannabis grower if I was given the chance, you know. And so that's, that's a pretty common uh, perspective that a lot of the growers have and they say you know this is 
just kind of another economic opportunity for me. Um, the other one I have is, is, you know, I'll just, you know, make up an example, but there's a lot of growers who say, gosh, I've got, you know, 500 acres of cattle pasture and I'm making, I'm scraping by, I'm making an okay living, but I could rent an acre or two of my land to a cannabis farmer and I could net the same amount of money off of that one or two acres as I could off of my entire operation, my entire cattle operation, and not really hurt my cattle operation in any way, shape, or form. And so they see it as a really, from an economic sustainability, it might be a good opportunity for them to, to lease out a little bit of their land to, to a cannabis farmer. So, um, you know, we've talked, we have an agricultural advisory uh, committee in, in Placer County that's talked about it a few times. And like I said, Farm Bureau's had those discussions and it's generally Really been a pretty much like we have a big table and maybe there's room for another seat at that table. Um, you know, a big dynamic I see, you know, talking to my colleagues on the Central Coast is kind of the, the cut flower industry and just kind of some of the economic woes of the cut flower industry. And that's probably the single industry that's most similar to the cannabis industry in the way that cultivation is done and the infrastructure that's needed. And there's, you know, kind of, I think it's specific to the Central Coast, there's a big shift in uh, that element transitioning from other types of traditional cut flowers over into cannabis cultivation. Um, so does that answer most of your question? I'm gonna jump on this one real quick. Um, I think it's really important to, when considering moving forward in your counties and, and what you're gonna do is really looking at the perspective of, of California and how much cannabis we're actually producing and being very mindful that it's, gonna, it's a very expensive process to transition. And if we overproduce, we're going to see a, a bust and boom. And so uh, I think that should be incorporated into to that conversation. Also pesticides, um, there, you know, con conventional agriculture has very different standards than what we're going to be looking at, and um, you know, I, I'm not an expert in this field, so I'm not going to I'm not going to say something I don't know. But I, I think that's also something that really needs to be considered for a lot of a lot of these places that have had a lot of heavy pesticide use. How that will uh, will or will not end up in in our testing requirements. Yeah, I'll, I'll just sort of keep directing a little bit on this question because uh, you mentioned two other things: agritourism and, and that sort of cross pollination concerns. So. No, no, I, maybe uh, I think it'd be interesting to hear some perspective from everyone on kind of their experience. We've heard about bed and breakfasts and other agricultural uh, tourism things. Um, you know, there are future also uh, potential for things like standards, practices and varietals, appellations and other types of protective organically principled types of certification. So maybe uh, the three of you could go through and address some of those different areas. Um, everybody should come to Humboldt. <laughs> And you should come tour our farms when we get to that place in policy. Um, we're not there yet. And so, I don't know. The cannabis farm is a magical place. I'll just put it that way. I've done a lot of tours. I've brought a lot of people to farms. It's very new and exciting and strange and kind of awkward and ex just a different experience. And so we, you know, we want, we want to capitalize on that. We want to bring people up. We also um, have a lot more to offer than just cannabis farms. We have a lot of ecotourism. We have a lot of incredible like farm to table and local, um, local businesses, small businesses. Um, so yeah, we're definitely looking at that and um, really excited to incorporate that into our program. But we need to get there from a policy level before we just bring a bunch of people out to the farms because, uh, yeah, there needs to be some rules on that one. Yeah, so ag tourism is, you know, it's a challenging issue just in and of itself, you know, absent cannabis. I know for Placer County, we struggle just with our winery ordinance and, you know, what's the right level of bringing the public out to our rural areas and the impacts on noise and traffic and, you know, weddings and all these other things that come along with ag tourism in general. That's That, that can be a challenging subject, you know, absent cannabis. And then when you throw cannabis in, you know, I think, you know, politically, at least, you know, my county is nowhere near that. I think I'd be interested in hearing what Amber says is about the, the, the micro business and how that plays in and whether that really does allow that full kind of winery experience at the cannabis farm in the long term. I'm not really sure if that provides that or not. Um, as far as the, the cross contamination or, or, or whatever, you know, I think there's a couple things, you know, it's, it's important to remember that industrial hemp is part of this conversation. And, um, you know, the cannabis farmers really don't want their girls, you know, messing around with the boys. And, um, 
you know, so there's going to be some really interesting things there where industrial hemp is specifically required to be cultivated at a field level. And so there's no individual plant tending. I'm not sure if there will be any sexting of plants, you know, for those who may not be aware, you know, cannabis is either a male plant or a female plant. They're separate plants for each gender and cannabis definitely does not want any male plants, you know, they don't want pollination because that provides, you know, produces seeds and lowers the quality of the flower, which is what you're wanting to harvest. And so industrial hemp on the other side is the exact same species, but without the THC, just based on its genetics, it is required by state law to be cultivated at this field level, more like a hay crop rather than an individual tomato plant. And so there's a good chance that if you have a lot of industrial hemp in the long run, it won't play well with the cannabis industry. Um, the other type of conflict I see really quickly is, you know, things like, you know, if, if, you know, we have a lot of rice in Placer County and rice is a grass crop, um, you know, it's a grass, it's a species of grass. And so we use a lot of broadleaf herbicides to, you know, get weeds out of our rice crop. You know, cannabis is a broadleaf plant. So if you had a bunch of cannabis farms in the middle of a rice growing area and you have crop dusters applying broadleaf herbicides, you know, that's just kind of a, you know, you're a guaranteed conflict. So there's going to be those kinds of issues as well. So the SB 94 created a new license type that Josh alluded to. Um, it's a, called a micro business and the Bureau, like I said, there's three different agencies that are responsible for issuing licenses and the Bureau under the Department of Consumer Affairs is going to be issuing a micro business license. A micro business license will allow you to cultivate, manufacture, and dispense at the same, the same business. Um, whether or not that will allow for retail sales, I honestly am not familiar enough with their areas of the law to understand. Um, but what I can tell you is that Food and Ag will be making sure that anyone who's issued a micro business license is cultivating to the same standard as everyone that we are giving cultivation licenses to. So I, hope I want to paraphrase the question so that for everybody can hear it in the room and then Amber can share. So you're asking the question about the three categories of yes, no, and nothing. And so the clarification you're seeking is on the nothing, uh, where CDFA may grant the license. If you came back later as a county and said, we're now a no, how does CDFA then react? Is that essentially the, the question? Uh, the law gives us two options at the state level. We can either revoke at the time that you tell us no, if that comes after 60 days and we've already issued the license, or we may elect to allow that person to continue to cultivate until their uh, next renewal comes up. And then we just wouldn't renew the license. Exactly. So there's two options. Um, I think it's going to depend on resources. We would appreciate if you could all get us an answer within 60 days, because yeah. I don't want to be issuing licenses and then having to go revoke or you know figure out when their renewal comes up. So we would definitely appreciate if you are at a point when we go to you in January, likely, um, that you can let us know that that person is or is not. But there is the law, the, the law really um, dictates what we can do and, and there's flexibility in what the state can do. And I think it's probably because we may not have the resources to go out and pull. And um, I think it's gonna become problematic if people go out, get a state license, and then you come back and say, no, I, I think that there's a litigation potential there on both sides. And, Well, that would be dependent on who they file it against. <laughs> it could be you, it could be me, it could be both of us. I don't know. Yeah, but it, it's it's likely to occur. To occur. Um, so, again, I would just really encourage that you all understand where you want to be at that point in time so that we don't have to go through that. So the comment was, you know, that with, in terms of the yes, no, maybe, there may be a discretionary permitting process that's ongoing. At the time, they're still applying for their state license, so they may not yet have a resolution. And keep that in mind from a perspective. Uh, so a question, if I might paraphrase, it's a very complex environment, evolving ordinances, evolving laws. How do you keep the, po the, the population of the county informed? Who's leading that effort? Is it more of an industry-led, or is it more of a county-led type of effort? That's a great question. Um, so I'm the executive director of a local trade association. We just launched maybe four months ago. However, advocacy in Humboldt on this issue has been going on for almost a decade. And it's been communication and it's been collaboration. And so my organization is just picking that ball back up. Um, I'm, su again, super happy to see my planning director here because this, this is how this works. And it is a robust 
and very strong commitment that we have to engage in communication. And, uh, you know, for example, if Director Ford, who has an immense workload right now, let me tell you, this gentleman right now has a thousand applications that he needs to get through a planning department really quickly so that they can go to her. So that's the game plan. And so, you know, if, if I, from industry, I start getting a lot of anxiety from my membership. And so I can pivot immediately to the director and be like, X, Y, and Z, how, you know, how do we respond? They can produce a, a statement, that statement then I can send out to the world. And honestly, it's been really interesting. Um, social media has been incredibly important for our local industry and particularly uh, Instagram. Who knew? Um, who knew? Who knew? It, it's it's like a really big deal. And from an industry perspective, we've never been able to engage again outside of our friends and our family. Now we get to talk about what we do for the first time. Oh my gosh, we're so proud, by the way. We have pictures and we have ideas and we're sharing them. And it's on the social media platform. And so Director Ford can produce you know, a statement. I can upload it to social media. Boom, I have access to 450 of the 1,000 applicants. You know, and. I can repost from Cal Cannabis, the Bureau, if that's what they're still called, I'm not sure. Anyways, yeah. okay, good. <laughs> um, so, so really, you know, it, it's collaboration and, and finding industry stakeholders and, that are willing to spend the time to uh, send that information out and, and then get that information back to the county too. Yeah, I, th I think um, ultimately it's finding people like Tara in your county and really identifying who, you know, you, we, we do a lot of different things. We, you know, we produce flyers, we hand out, you know, thousands of flyers at our grow stores. A lot of them, I think, go in the trash because, you know, the grow stores maybe aren't all interested in getting their growers into compliance. Um, you know, we, we do stuff on our county outreach system, but that's really geared towards a different crowd. That's, that's the people who are already engaged in government, you know, local government. Um, so really it's, it's, identifying leaders in the industry and in some cases helping those leaders get up to speed on how you form an organization that's a that's an investment that's well worth it you know uh, just the difference between two years ago we didn't have any industry leadership till today we do have a, a functioning uh, you know grower alliance or whatever you call it and just instead of me having to go chase down, you know, and try to get the word out, you know, having a conduit that's already in the industry and more trusted than myself to, you know, convey that information. That's, that's really the best thing you can do is really, you know, it's a little unconventional to help cannabis growers organize into a group. Um, that's not a typical role for local government, but it'll pay huge dividends if you can really identify some leadership and you know, help them along in, in getting a little bit organized so that you only have one or two people to work with instead of like hundreds. Also shamelessly plug the organizations that I, uh, my state level organization, California Growers Association um, has been working for a couple years and has a massive outreach. Um, our email list is 10,000 strong and, and if you, so we do regional chapters. And so if, again, you can find some leadership in your county that really wants to spearhead this, and then you can dovetail and go and talk with that, uh, with that organization, you can really get some of those um, basics on how to start moving forward and developing relationships. So I paraphrase the question, you know, in addition to learning agricultural compliance, you have to learn business compliance. And, and how is the industry going through that permutation of becoming a normalized, regulated business? That's an awesome question. Um, so how do I start with this? Um, back to, I think I'll start on the technical end of it. So it goes back to the centralized processing, what I was talking about. It's really important from my perspective that that's incorporated into any, uh, any land use model um, that removes that additional cost to those landowners, removes the activity of trimming and on site, and uh, again, gives more oversight and protection to workers, which is really important. Um, how is the industry dealing with regulation? You know, some days it's, oh my gosh, this is so unreal. Look, I get to be on Instagram and I'm not gonna worry about guns in my face. My entire existence eradicated uh, in a single day, or, you know, not existence, I should say, but uh, business. Um, and then some days it's a full-blown meltdown. It's panic. Are we going to survive? Am I doing this 
because I, it's a good idea or am I doing this because I felt like I had to do this? And we're going through an identity crisis right now. Another uh, big issue, it's not necessarily an issue, but another big thing that's happening that I, I didn't expect when I started this was a fracturing within my own community right now. Uh, we have family members turning on family members. We have people who are upriver or downriver from somebody who's not participating who are turning to the sheriff for the first time and being like, go get them, you know? And so it's, it's interesting. I, I think I want to start a time capsule and have everybody write their experiences and dig it up in 10 or 15 years because it's, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I, th I think that's, uh, that was kind of the comments I had about the zero to 100 miles an hour. And, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, I, I had a, a game warden tell me about a few months ago. He said, you know, a lot of these issues aren't particular to the species of plants as much as, you know, his comment was if people grew broccoli using some of these practices, we'd put them in jail. You know, it's, it's not that it's cannabis, it's just that a lot of the practices and a lot of the things and really addressing those things like unpermitted septic systems or lack of septic systems, you know, and, and so if you're going to not issue a permit to somebody until they're fully compliant, does that mean all their code violations? Does that mean, you know, they have unpermitted timber harvest, you know, all these different things that they have to rectify. Um, it can be really, really challenging versus kind of taking baby steps and saying, what are those baby steps, you know, uh, you know, this, everything from a conditional use permit to code compliance with their house or their structure that they're living in in an unpermitted fashion to the state's regulations. It's a, it's a phenomenal, you know, to start at zero and get into that system is a pretty amazing uh, task. Okay, so this again goes back to the, the sort of silence. If there is sort of in a provisional pattern within that 60 day, you know, is there any clarification or guidance you could give on how they should be looking for you to react? Uh, I was just re-educating myself on the maze and the shalls in that section of the law. Um, and under E, it does say that, oh, I'm trying to figure out if we have to issue after 60 days. Yes, the licensing authority, so that's us, shall make a reputable presumption that the applicant is in compliance with all local ordinances and regulations. So we don't really have a choice at that point. We have to assume that they are in compliance if we get silence. And I think to Dave's comment, I wanted to add, I believe, and that's actually why I pulled out my legislation here, I believe it's any law or regulation or ordinance, it doesn't have to be specific to cannabis. So if they're out of compliance with something else, you can say, no, they're not in compliance with all laws, ordinances uh, at the local level. So there's, there's a lot of this code is a good one for you and your county attorney to sit down with and really get familiar with. Um, again, the, this legislation just passed and this language, um, was new to us, so we're just getting comfortable with it. So again, I would encourage all of you to become familiar with Business and Professions Code. It's 26055. It's a pretty lengthy code, but it's got all those, all those, all those intricacies in there. Okay, so the question relates to a follow-up from the, the scoping activity that was done to try to get some counts on numbers for potential licensees. <laughs> so I'll just clarify that it wasn't the Bureau that sent that out. It was us, uh, the Cal Cannabis. So Bureau is separate from us, and they're not responsible for cultivation. Um, but what we did was it's really difficult to plan our program without having any clue how many people are going to come to us January 1st to get a license. So that survey that we did, um, sometimes I regret doing that survey because of how it's being used. Um, that was to give us a general baseline of the, the industry's desire to be licensed. So it is flawed because it was sent out in a survey and from my understanding you get very little response from surveys, although we did have, I think it was 14,000 responses saying, yes, I want to be licensed. This is what county I want to be licensed in. This is what size I want to be licensed. It doesn't mean that the county was permissive. It doesn't mean that they're going to meet the requirements. So it was just kind of a baseline for us to understand, like, who's interested. 
Um, and as far as doing another one, because of the flaws, I'm not sure that we would do that. What we're relying on more is understanding what's happening at the local level. Um, I know in some counties, they're limiting the number of licenses. That's much more helpful to us. So Trinity County says 500, that's it. Th then we can understand we're going to get 500 probably from Trinity County. Uh, Men Mendocino, Humboldt County have given us pretty solid numbers of what we should expect. Um, so that is for us anyways in a planning environment is much more uh, valuable to base our needs on and that was kind of what it was for. It's also a good idea for you to understand at the local level the interest in your county. Um, but that, that's kind of where that originated and what it was intended for. So I don't see moving out and doing another one of those in the same capacity again. Maybe rather um, asking the local agencies are you permissive? Yes. Do you have a limit? No. Are you doing indoor, outdoor, mixed light? You know, because some are just allowing outdoor, some are just allowing indoor. It's kind of all over the place. And I think that would actually be more valuable than just going out to the industry and saying, are you interested? Unless you guys think that there's value in some of that for you, please talk with me and we can consider it. Um, but I don't think that we'll be repeating that. So a question on environmental impacts and, you know, and on top of the regulations, what other things could they potentially be anticipating from a compliance perspective? So our environmental impact report, the draft, is showing that there's no significant impacts that can't be mitigated. Um, we have done some draft mitigations in the medical regulations. Uh, for instance, we proposed banning generators. That went over well. <laughs> Uh, we also proposed a 42% green energy. Um, we received a lot of feedback, and again, I'm, I'm being totally truthful here that we received very valuable feedback that can help us reconsider those numbers, those, you know, just general bans moving forward. But I, there's these holes in our CEQA document that someone's going to have to address, either the local agency or we will have to become the lead agency and work directly with the applicant but for those site-specific things that aren't addressed in our CEQA document. And I'm sorry I don't have the areas of the document that that, um, that that was the conclusion that we needed more than what we could assess on a statewide level, but it's all there. <laughs> it's a big document. I brought it with me to one meeting, and I'm not bringing it again because people are, like, intimidated by it. It's a big document, but there's an executive summary, good place to go. Um, that's on our website. And the executive summary is very... Um, it's, it's little bites where you can see the conclusion in each section and, and see where there's, hole, where there's holes. So I'm sorry I don't have the specifics, but those are called out. Yeah, I'm just going to paraphrase that one as compliance. <laughs> it's a compliance question, right? So it, it, you, know, you can take a lot of different angles on that one. Yeah, well, I mean, for Placer County, we've studied that issue a lot, and it's like no matter, you know, anything from as close to, you know, a ban as you can get in compliance with Prop 64, you know, all the way to a commercial system, there's resources that are required. And, you know, without, you know, some kind of enforcement teeth, anything you do is completely meaningless. And so that's really one of the challenges. And so even if you are in a situation where you're just allowing people to have their six plants indoors in compliance with 64, you're, you're still, you know, you're either not going to enforce it and it's not going to be a meaningful ordinance or you're going to be spending money. And, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of where Placer County is at the moment. And that's a half a million dollar program to, you know, that's about where we came to, to have something that actually had some meaningful teeth in it with no commercial activities. So, um, you know, that, that's just the reality of the situation is if you want to have a meaningful program, it's going to cost you money. Without a commercial program, there's not really a lot of revenue opportunities. So, uh, from an industry perspective, um, in Humboldt County, you know, we've coined it red dot, yellow dot, green dot. And you're a red dot if you did not sign up to do this. You're a yellow dot if you're in Director Ford's office right now. And you're a green dot if you've been issued a permit. And so we have defined lines that we are going to be able to. Um, to look at and those who are complying and those who aren't for the first time ever. Uh, as far as my county and what they're doing to put the teeth down on these folks who are red dots, um, they're, they're moving pretty fast and furious on uh, establishing that framework and moving it to code, code enforcement. And I look forward to seeing their next move on really how they're going to uh, address the red dots. 
and the couple red dots I know are, uh, they're really looking forward to figuring out how they're going to address them too. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Uh, I think you know, we're getting close to wrapping up uh, our time here. So I apologize that we're, we're not going to take any more questions, although uh, I want to thank our esteemed panelists. Um, and I'm sure they'll be around uh, at least immediately after this meeting, if, if not for other parts of the day. Um, as we close up, I just wanted to give each of you maybe 90 seconds, you know, based on some of the questions you've gotten, uh, anything you wanted to add on any of the conversations that were had over the last hour and a half, or any uh, public resources maybe that you want to quickly publish out to them in terms of websites or other places for the participants to go look for additional information. I think I'd just follow up with uh, working with the industry, do your best to go and find folks who have the time, who have uh, the commitment and who want to move the industry forward locally and establish relationships with them and, um, and make sure you educate yourself on what's happening on a state level. I think that's something that uh, our county, we're really working hard to keep up and um, I think that's really important. Oh, in the final, I would definitely encourage your counties or jurisdictions to create advisory boards or commissions or something of that nature. Uh, I think it streamlines the process of communication. I would absolutely echo everything Tara just said and I would just leave you with the fact that I comfort myself by looking forward 10 years and I know that I'll be laughing at how ignorant I was and naive at this point in my life. <laughs> You're here. Um, I would just uh, really encourage everybody to stay engaged in the state process, whether it's CEQA, whether it's the development of regulations. This is not happening to you. It's happening with you at this point. We are accepting comments, and we really, really need them. We don't know everything. We want to learn from your experience. Um, there is a state website that's been developed for all three licensing authorities. It's called cannabis.ca.gov. And if you can just retain that one, you can get to all three of our websites um, and find a whole bunch of information. And we all have uh, listservs. That's a way that we communicate with our, with the people who are interested in what's happening with our um, agency. Ours, I just checked, and it's about 6,000 strong, which is pretty big. Um, but if you haven't signed up and you want to stay engaged with what we're doing, just go to our website, sign up, and we'll send you an automatic email. We really try not to spam, but anytime it has anything important to do with cultivation, that's a huge, you don't have to go seek it. It just comes to you. <laughs> and all three licensing authorities are doing that. So if you haven't signed up for our, our automatic emails, please do so. I think it's just a good way to keep uh, up to date on what's happening. Um, we are an open door. If you have questions, if you want to get a better idea of where we're headed, I will be honest with you if we don't know yet. Um, or if we do know, we will let you know. So let me give you our phone number. We answer the phone, 85-916-263-0801. And I think it's also on my PowerPoint. Um, and we have a general email also on the PowerPoint that you can email. We respond to those on a daily basis. So we're really an open door. We really want to work with you as much as possible because it's going to make everything easier for all of us if we coordinate uh, well beforehand. Um, I know that there's going to be some challenges moving forward, but the more that we coordinate, and I appreciate CSAC for inviting me here today and allowing the opportunity to let you know where the state's at. And um, I will be able to stick around for a couple minutes afterwards. So thank you guys. Thank you, everybody.